well do you think you manage uncertainty? So let's say you're waiting to hear back from a client, you're, you've conducted an interview and you're waiting for the response. Do you psychotically go in and check your email or check your text messages to see you know, if it's coming back? Or do you just kind of like throw it to the wind and kind of go, whatever happens, happens. Do you worry in January that even though you've might've done awesome in your business or career for the past, I don't know, 10, 15 years of your life, but since you don't know how the rest of the year is going to go, do you sit there and kind of go, how am I going to do that again? And start worrying about the future, worrying about things you don't know, things you can't control. And there's a degree to which that will either completely paralyze you or not. Most of us, we have sort of certain things in our lives that make us really, 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 really anxious when we are dealt the blow of the great unknown. And there's, I've been doing some research on this because there's my masterminds coming up and there's a lot of the dealing with uncertainty behaviors that can manifest in so many different ways. Last week, we talked about procrastination. We talked about the amygdala, the little dragon at the top of our spine. If you haven't watched it, please go watch it because it's really important. Um, but when it comes to specifically dealing with uncertainty and the anxiety that can be produced, sometimes, again, it can be debilitating. It can stop us from doing things. Or we get into a habit of trying to predict. And so we're like, okay, I'm going to do this, and then that's going to happen, and that, and that, and that. And depending on what that, that, that looks like, it can be something where like, well, I'm just not going to do this thing, even though it might double my business. It might not. And I get into arguments with my clients all the time because they present these unknown uncertainty-based fears. Well, what if this doesn't happen? Of course, my answer is, but what if it does? Well, what if it doesn't? What if it does? I can do this all day long because there are infinite number of opportunities as to what may happen in the future because there's nothing that we can control. Anxiety disorder is actually predicated on what happens next. When my son was small, he was three years old, and I realized he had anxiety disorder. How do you help a three-year-old child, a four-year-old child, five-year-old child with coping with anxiety? And because this question was always, what happens next? What's coming next, mommy? I made him these little books. So it's a Monday book, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Because he couldn't read, um, I put little pictures. So as soon as he wake up on Monday, I'd hand him his Monday book. There was a little picture of him getting up. Then there was another picture about breakfast. And then after breakfast, it was taking them to daycare. And then after daycare, it was taking the kids to school. So there was this pictorial view of exactly how his day was going to be. And I tried to make it as predictable as possible so as to reduce the anxiety. And that is actually an example of what you can do to try to help yourself through uncertainty, anxiety type behaviors. If you are not having conversations, not exhibiting behaviors, like making calls to grow your business, doing a presentation that you know would attract new people to you, asking for something, having difficult conversations about anything with anybody. If you're avoiding these things because you're just like, well, I don't know how it's going to go. What you can do is create some tests. So with these tests, you identify what are you actually anxious about? So maybe you're actually anxious about putting down your phone. Maybe the idea of not answering your phone for 20 minutes so you can focus on money-making ventures and activities causes you anxiety. So if 20 minutes causes you anxiety, why don't you try it for five? So what you do is you create these controlled experiments where you take your anxious thing and you break it down to something that is a little bit manageable. So it's uncertainty, but it's almost like a manageable amount of uncertainty before you feel like you might be starting to go off the rails. So the example of putting your phone away so you can concentrate on your work causes you anxiety. And if I, maybe if I said to you, you know, you really need to put it away for an hour and it freaks you out because you're afraid of losing business, not returning a call. Someone else is going to get the client that's calling you, whatever it is that you've created in your mind and I'll believe to be true, make it a small experiment. So say five minutes, you're going to take this thing and maybe you're going to give it to somebody or you're going to put it in another room, right? So do something where you control the situation, do the small parts, and then just go for it. Put on a timer, right? You may feel anxious, right? But it's a matter of, you know, do the deep breathing. You can get through it, try to concentrate. And when that little alarm goes off and your five minutes is up, the important thing at this point is to do an assessment. How did it go? right? This part, the assessment piece is critical to ensuring that you don't just glaze over the fact 
that a little bit of controlled uncertainty is actually okay. So controlled experiments. And then what you can do is you can take those experiments and you can extend them a little bit, right? So maybe you go from five minutes to 10 minutes, do the same thing, put your phone in another room, give it to someone else, whatever, turn it off, whatever you feel like you can control. Because remember with the, with anxiety, you may try to pull the ripcord too early, let the experiment ride, right? So from five minutes to 10, you put your phone down, have something that you can concentrate on, make it really engaging, make it something that brings you joy, something that you like, right? Don't make it something you hate doing because then it'll trip up your brain and, you know, and away you go. You'll go back to your phone and the experiment won't ride. So at the end of the 10 minutes, you do an assessment. How did it go? Right? There's going to be times and you probably felt that upwelling of anxiety, but it'll go away again. You may feel an upwelling of some story, some assumption, some prediction that you believe so much to be true. It's going to happen, right? Let the 10 minutes ride. See how you do. Do an assessment. Did you die? No. Did everything go okay? Okay. Everything went okay. You can plan for things. You can accommodate yourself. And then over time, as you get a little bit more comfortable with being uncomfortable, a little bit more comfortable with the fact that uncertainty isn't a saber tooth tire, it's not going to eat you and that you can handle it. You can learn to cope with it. You'll be able to expand yourself into other comfort zone blowing activities so that you can learn and so that you can grow. The comfort zone is the most dangerous place for us to hang out. Like I said last week, if you watch that video, it should be renamed something like the most horrible place for you to be where all the nightmares go to die, right? That's what your comfort zone is. You don't grow in a comfort zone. You wait for people to tell you what to do. You don't create your own future. You wait for someone else to make you happy because you're afraid of asking for it yourself. It is a terrible place to be. In order to blow out of your comfort zone, you are going to be faced with a certain degree of uncertainty. And if it really scares you, and there are so many people, so many areas of the spectrum that you can be, it can absolutely paralyze you or you may not care at all. But wherever you are on the spectrum of uncertainty and the intolerance of uncertainty, which is actually a thing that leads to generalized anxiety disorders, it can lead to depression, it can lead to a whole bunch of other mental health issues, and it can also negatively affect relationships, your work, your career, and your happiness. So if your intolerance to uncertainty is super, super high, right? Or if it prevents you from doing anything, try uncertainty controlled experiments. Allow yourself to just inch your way out. It's called a step laddering. If you're really, really anxious about something, you kind of go from zero to all the way to the end result. You will die in the process, okay? But you can inch your way in. I'll give you another example before I wrap up this video. My son, same son, um, when he was in grade, I think it was grade three or grade four, could not go to gym class, would run away. So I worked with his teacher. I'm like, okay, we're going to do step laddering. So instead of forcing him to participate in the class, which really wasn't going to work, because um, this kid would like take off like out of the school kind of a thing, we needed him to stay in school. So what we did is we would say, okay, there's like a door to the hall and then there's like a little sort of internal hallway and then a door to the gym. So Zach could sit with his door, with his back against it. So he could hold the inner door open, but he just, all he had to do was sit there and that's it. And then one day they would say, okay, well, why don't you sit just inside the door? So that's what he would do. Still not participating. You know, a little bit later, they would give him a ball to bounce with, right? Everyone's doing their thing, but he's doing something just by himself controlled. And then he'd have a friend come and do it. And then if there was something to do, they'd put him behind a screen so that he wouldn't worry about people looking at him because that's a part of where his anxiety came from. And then it took four years, but after four years, he was now in the intramural leadership group. He was helping little kids overcome the same problems. And he continues to do that to this day. He understands the concept of step lottery. He understands he has anxiety, but he also understands how to cope with his intolerance of uncertainty of the what is going to happen next. This kid's going to be going to university soon. He's going to be faced with some massive uncertainty and a lot of self-reliance. It's important for him, for all of us, to understand how to deal with uncertainty, how to cope with what we have, but also to push ourselves to say, to challenge our predictions. We're almost always wrong. To challenge our assumptions. Those are almost always wrong as well because they're outside of us. We can't control the environment, people, anything, but we can control us. We can allow this whole thing to work. 
We can allow our amygdala to not see the world and uncertainty as a threat. We can see it as growth. And it's up to you to decide where are you in the spectrum of your intolerance to uncertainty. Do some controlled experiments. Understand that it's okay to have a little bit of, in, of intolerance to uncertainty, but not so much that it wrecks your happiness, your growth, and your fulfillment. I hope you found this as helpful as I have because I use it for myself. I use it to teach my kids and I use it to teach my clients because there's so much uncertainty in our world. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we feared it just a little bit less?